Now, if you take out your message notes, we're continuing in our series on how God turns setbacks into comebacks. You'd probably agree that it's always easier to start something uh, than it is to finish it, right? It's easier to get into something than it is to get out. It's easier to fill your schedule than it is to fulfill your schedule. It's easier to get into debt than it is to get out of debt. It's easy to make a commitment. It's harder to keep a commitment. And yet life is really like a marathon because as time goes on, people start thinning out. You know, at the start of a race, it's always very, very crowded. But as the race progresses, uh, you have fewer and fewer people and there are wider spaces between the runners. And the reason why is because in the race of life, we have setbacks. And that's why we're doing this whole series. Life is not easy. My goal during this series, as your pastor who loves you, is to help you finish well. And it's why I'm teaching this series on how God turns setbacks into comebacks. Now, it's, it's part of the character building process where God wants to make you like Jesus, that he doesn't make life easy. He lets you experience the, the, the things that happen in a broken world. Now, because we all have setbacks, one of the great enemies uh, of your spiritual maturity is actually discouragement. Discouragement is deadly. It can get you off track. When you have a setback and you get discouraged, you can get set on the shelf. Uh, discouragement is common. We all get discouraged. It's powerful. Uh, it is universal. It involves everybody. And it is recurring. It doesn't just happen one, in, one time in your life. Some of you came to worship today feeling discouraged about something that's been happening in your life. Well, today, we're gonna look at a story that illustrates both the causes and the cures for discouragement. And it teaches us what to do when you feel like giving up. So if you've been discouraged, you picked a good week to come to church. Now, the story we're gonna look at is found in the book of Nehemiah, chapter four. By the way, if you're in leadership in your business or in uh, government or in any kind of industry of any type or uh, a social area, or if you're in management, you really need to study this book, Nehemiah. It's a book about leadership and about management. By the way, Pastor Tom Holliday has a great book on, written about the book of Nehemiah. I do too, but mine is only in Spanish. And I wrote a book on leadership it's only available in Spanish. Tom's is actually available in English. So I would highly recommend uh, you pick up his book unless you speak Spanish. Now, the story of Nehemiah is the story of rebuilding the city wall around Jerusalem. Now, the background is after spending 70 years in captivity in Babylon, that was during the days of Daniel, uh, the Jews, the entire nation of Jews who'd been taken captive and moved over to, uh, to Babylon were allowed to return to their capital city 70 years later to Jerusalem. And when they got back, it was a mess. It was in ruins. Uh, but what was needed before they could rebuild the city was they needed to rebuild the wall around the city for protection because the wall had been torn down. And then once they were protected by the wall, they could build everything else. Now, the Bible tells us that everybody worked very hard at the start and they quickly rebuilt the wall to half its original height once all the people got back home. But the initial enthusiasm wore off and they got discouraged and they got discouraged because of four very common causes of discouragement. And I think as we go through this passage today, you're gonna see yourself in some or maybe all four of these causes of discouragement. So let's pick up the story of Nehemiah in chapter four. And Nehemiah is narrating a story. Let's read it here. Nehemiah four, starting with verse six down to verse 12. Nehemiah says, so we rebuilt the wall around Jerusalem until it had reached half its original height because the people worked at it with all their heart. But then, and here's where it turns, then the other tribes in our area heard about our progress and how Jerusalem, uh, the walls were being repaired and how all the gaps were being closed. And they became very angry and they all plotted together to attack Jerusalem and to create some confusion to stop the progress. So we prayed to God for protection and we posted 24 hour guards 
But about that same time, the people of Jerusalem began to complain. And here's what they said. They said, we're tired and we're worn out and we can't keep up this pace. Besides that, there's so much rubble and trash to be removed. We now realize that we can't finish this wall. Meanwhile, our enemies are threatening to kill us in order to stop this work. Then those of us who lived closest to our enemies, that's the Jews who'd come back but lived outside of the walls of Jerusalem, uh, those who lived close to the enemies kept reporting over and over and over 10 times that our enemies kept saying, it doesn't matter where you go, we will attack you. Now, we're gonna look at four common causes of discouragement uh, out of this passage, and I want you to see what, happ what happens first when it typically sets in. When does discouragement s sets in? Well, verse six says, they worked hard on the wall, rebuilding it until it reached half its original height. You might underline that, half its original height. Now this is typical because discouragement sets in at the halfway point. Not at the beginning, not at the end, but when you get discouraged is right in the middle. For instance, let's say you're on one island in Hawaii, let's say you're on Oahu, and you're gonna row a boat over to Maui. Well, where are you gonna get the most discouraged? Well, you're not gonna get discouraged at the beginning. You're not gonna get discouraged when you can see Maui. You're gonna get discouraged when you can't see either shore. That's right in the middle. You can't see where you came from. You can't see where you're going. Typically, discouragement strikes at the midpoint of a project. For instance, if you're climbing up a mountain, halfway up the mountain, you go, I still gotta get to the top, and then I gotta get all the way back. Have you ever been in a, a painting project, like painting a room or painting your house? And halfway through the painting, you go, oh man, we still got half to go, and then we gotta clean up. Halfway through writing a book, you get discouraged. Halfway through college, you go, maybe I wasn't fit for college. Halfway, you know, through the year, you go, this year's not over, the dog days of summer. Halfway through your career, halfway through your marriage, halfway through your life, that's called a midlife crisis. That's when discouragement often sets in. Sometimes you have it in little areas, but sometimes you have it in big areas. Now in this story, we have a very clear example of the four kinds of setbacks that cause discouragement. So I want you to write these down. Here's, here's what they are. Number one, we get discouraged when something takes longer than I expected. When something takes longer than I expected, and that causes fatigue. Now in this story, the builders would work very, very hard, and there's a lot of physical work. They're physically exhausted, they're weary, they're worn out, and in Nehemiah 4, verse 10, the first part of the verse, it says this. They said, we're tired and we're worn out and we can't keep up this pace. Some of you have been saying that this week. I'm tired, I'm worn out, I can't keep this pace. We've simply run out of energy. Now, I know this. I was talking to the guys who are taping this right now that the first part of this week was very rough for me. Uh, because of some issues in my health and then a couple of crises that I had to deal with as pastor. Uh, the first 80 hours of this week, I only got six hours of sleep. That's not a good thing. And you know what? I was worthless and I was ineffective because I couldn't really get anything done. When you're tired, when you're worn out, you can't even think straight. You know, studies show that most Americans are sleep deprived. And the number one cause of discouragement is physical and emotional exhaustion. Last week in that message on Elijah, I, I quoted Vince Lombardi, the great football coach, who said, fatigue makes cowards of all of us. And how amazing it is that things look better after just a good night's sleep. Now, this principle is, is true. When things take longer than you think, you start getting tired, you start getting weary, you start getting exhausted. If you don't get your rest, you're gonna get discouraged. That's why God created the Sabbath. Every six days you take a day off. You know, in agriculture, farmers rotate their crops because uh, they know that a field that's rested 
it hasn't had a, that year hasn't had a crop on it, that a field that's rested produces a greater harvest. Some of you don't know who Frederick Taylor is, but you ought to thank him. You say, why? Well, in, in 1893, this guy named Frederick Taylor did the first scientific study of work habits. And he did it in a steel mill and Mr. Taylor proved that people accomplish more if they take regular rest breaks. So you need to thank Frederick Taylor for all your coffee breaks. He's the guy who thought that up. Our best requires rest. You know, the other day I learned that the reason that bats can live 20 years, which is a long time for a small animal. Small animals don't live a long time. Bats can live 20 years because they have the ability to do deep relaxation. A bat can lower its pulse from 180 beats a minute to just three beats a minute, and that extends their life. When you're tired, you're much more vulnerable to all kinds of things, including attacks from other people and criticism. It, it tends to affect you more. When people say things about you and you're full of energy and vitality and vigor, doesn't bother you, but when people say things about you and you're tired, it gets to you. Deuteronomy 25, verse 18, look at this verse. He, it says, never forget how the Amalekites attacked you when you were exhausted and weary, and they struck you down, those who began to lag behind. When you're weary, when you're exhausted, you start to lag behind, that's when Satan is gonna attack you. Here's the point, that when you're tired, you're being set up for an attack. And it may be an attack of discouragement, maybe attack of temptation. It may be attack of self-pity. And if you're tired right now, guess what? You're probably gonna be facing some attacks. How are you being attacked right now? Fatigue makes you vulnerable. So the first cause of discouragement is if you just get tired, you're gonna be more susceptible to discouragement. When things take longer, than you expected. Now here's a second kind of setback that causes discouragement. And we see that in the, in the next part of this verse. And it's when something is more complicated than, it, than you expected, than I expected. In other words, you start out on a project and discover it's not only taking longer, it's just a whole lot harder than I thought it would be. And how long a project takes can cause fatigue but how complicated a project is can cause frustration. And both fatigue and frustration can cause discouragement. <laughs> Have you ever tried to clean out a closet or, or your files? And, and, and what you do is you sit down and you, you dump all your files out on the floor in your office and you start trying to decide what to do with all you've got and, and, and you, you know, work on it for a few hours and then you go, this is crazy. And then you just dump them all back in, into, uh, into the files and throw it back you know, in the way they were. You got discouraged. It just was more complicated. You were having to make too many decisions. I remember a couple years ago, we remodeled our house and I was amazed at how much trash and junk they had to carry off, you know, just in remodeling. Broken bricks and dirt and dried mortar and rocks and that permanent porta potty and that wonderful smell that it had. All the stuff that had to be carried off just when we were trying to build something. You know, here's the point. Anytime you try to build anything, a career, a plan, a project, a life, a hobby, a family, a marriage, you ain't trying you try to build anything, you're gonna have some debris. And that is frustrating because things take longer than you expect and things are more complicated than you expect and that causes discouragement. And that's the second back, uh, setback that the people faced in Jerusalem. It was not only taking too long, building this wall was too complicated and there was too much junk and, and trash laying around. The second part of Nehemiah, four verse 10 says this, second complaint said, it, we're, we're tired, but second they said, there's so much rubble and trash to be removed. So much rubble and trash to be removed. Now follow me on this. They get discouraged because there's junk, the walls have been torn down and there's piles of garbage, rubble, uh, plaster, junk, trash, rocks, 
laying all around and they can't even move. There's so much rubble in their lives. You may not realize it, but you got rubble in your life. It could be emotional rubble. It could be relational rubble. Too many relationships. It could be, uh, you know, uh, material rubble. You got too many things in your life. You need to simplify. So let me on this day give you Rick's rules of rubble. <laughs> this isn't in your notes, but I'm gonna give it to you anyway. Rick's rules of rubble. All right, here they are. Number one, rubble is a part of life. In other words, you can't avoid it. You're gonna have piles of trash in your life. You're gonna have stuff that piles up in your life that you haven't dealt with. And the, the bigger the pile gets, the more frustrated you get by it. You're fatigued by the work, but you're frustrated by the complexity of all you've got to do. So rubble piles up. Rick's rule number two, you have to clean it out of your life periodically. You have to take out the trash. Emotionally, you take out the trash by confession to God. Number three, if you don't deal with it, it'll eventually take over. Uh, let me let you in on a little secret. You've probably already figured this out. Trash multiplies when you aren't watching. <laughs> Have you noticed that? Uh, it just kind of multiplies. You go, where'd all that come from? How, how do the dishes pile up so quickly in the kitchen? How, how do clothes pile up so quickly in the bedroom? And so many, it, just, it multiplies while you aren't watching. Let me give you a fourth rule of rubble. You don't always recognize what's rubble in your life, but other people do. Other people can see stuff in your life that you've allowed to stay there that's really holding you back, that's hindering you. And maybe you don't even see it because you're so, so used to living with it that you don't even realize it's rubble. There's some stuff you need to clean out and clear out in your life some activities, some relationships, some things, some events, some bad attitudes, some wrong thoughts, some misconceptions, mental, physical, emotional, spiritual rubble in your life that you need to clear out. You know, and a lot of people don't see it. We don't see it in our own lives, but other people see it. In fact, sometimes it takes an expert to point it out. By the way, that's why all those clean out shows on TV are so popular, where somebody comes in and helps them organize and say, man, you got trash all over here. Let's get, let's get your house cleaned out and cleaned up. Question, what's the rubble in your life? This was the second cause of discouragement in the, in the, in the Jews of Jerusalem. What's the rubble in your life? It's the stuff that keeps tripping you up. You might write that down. The rubble is the stuff that keeps tripping me up up in life. It may be a misconception, an attitude. It may be a habit. It's the stuff that keeps tripping you up. Rubble can be the trivia that wastes your time, that wastes your energy, that keeps you from accomplishing what's most important. They had a job to finish, finish the wall. Let's say we can't do it because there's so much trash laying around, we can't even get to rebuild the wall. What do you need to do? You need to just tell God about the rubble in your life and ask for help. Psalm 25, 18 says, come Lord and show me mercy for I feel helpless and overwhelmed and in deep distress. If you're feeling helpless and overwhelmed and in deep distress in your life right now because of something that's holding you back, that's rubble and you need to deal with it. We're gonna look at the cause, a cure in just a second. But here's another uh, setback. Here's a third setback that will cause you to be discouraged. And it happened in Nehemiah and it's, day and it's gonna happen to you. It's when I start to doubt my own ability. When I start to doubt my own ability, then this causes a sense of failure. Now, when you add that to fatigue, you got fatigue and you got frustration, Fatigue, it's taking too long. Frustration, it's too complicated. And then you start having a sense of failure. Well, now it's getting serious. I'm gonna get discouraged. That's the third part of Nehemiah 4, verse 10. The people said, look at this. The people said, we now realize that we cannot, not will not, we cannot finish this wall. Whoa, what just happened? 
New American Bible says, we will never be able to finish this wall. What happened? They've already built half of it. Why all of a sudden they've decided that they can't finish it? I mean, like I said, they've already built half of it, but now they've lost their confidence. Uh, you know, now, now they, they feel, they're filled with self-doubt. Now they're questioning why they even started. Now they say, well, you, know, why, you know, I was foolish to even think about doing this. You ever felt that way? Why did I take this job? Why did I get married? Why did I make this move? You start second guessing yourself. You start doubting yourself. You start filling yourself with feelings of failure. And like, I can't do this. You lose your confidence. You start feeling like, like you're a failure because of the frustration and fatigue. And they, they feel the failure. They are unable to finish the task as quickly as they originally planned. And the result is their confidence goes in the toilet. It goes down the drain. They lose their heart. They lose their enthusiasm. Now, let me ask as a pastor who loves you, a real important question. How do you handle failure? How do you react when your plans collapse? How do you react when it's taken longer than you thought, it's more complicated than you thought, and you start doubting, do I even have the ability to do this? What do you do? Do you give in to self-pity? And you have a pity party, poor me. Everybody hates me, nobody loves me, I'm gonna go eat worms. <laughs> you have a pity party and you invite you, me, myself, and I. Or you start complaining and you start saying, it's impossible. You know, you start having that feeling, you know, about the time I, I, I make ends meet, somebody moves the ends. Or do you start blaming other people? and say, well, they let me down, or they didn't tell me how hard it was gonna be. When... Listen, if at first you don't succeed, you're normal, <laughs> you're normal. Nobody succeeds at first. Successful people simply see failure as a temporary setback. This whole series is on learning the spiritual quality of resilience of trusting God for a comeback. There is no comeback without first a setback. And that setback may be this third one where you just start doubting your own ability to go, I don't think I'm even up for the task. I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can finish what I've started. Now, finally, there's a fourth setback. And, and we see this in this next verse, and it is this. You start to give up. You feel like giving up when the opposition grows stronger. Now, when you start a progress uh, project, probably nobody even cares, they don't even notice. And, uh, and so you don't have any opposition usually at the start. But as you start growing, you start being effective, the opposition, people aren't gonna like the changes you make in you, the changes you make in your marriage, in your family, in your job, the things you're trying to do for the Lord, and the opposition starts coming against you, the more visible you become. And guess what? The moment you put your shingle out and say, well, I'm open for business, somebody's gonna start throwing rocks at it. And that causes fear. So now we've got a combination of fatigue, frustration, failure, and fear. That's enough to discourage anybody. Now let me give you the background of this. There were enemies in and around Jerusalem who had moved in when the Jews had been taken captive and moved to Babylon for 70 years. And when the Jews were allowed to come back to their homeland, they did not want the Jews moving back. And two, they did not want the wall rebuilt around the city because it couldn't be attacked, it couldn't be taken advantage of, they, they couldn't victimize the people. And so, the enemy tribes around Jerusalem had a number of tactics they used. And if you go read the book of, Je of uh, Nehemiah, here's what they did. First, they just criticized the builders. And they said, what are you guys doing? You, you can't do this. Do you like to be criticized? No, nobody does. So they, they criticized the builders. And then the second thing they did in, in the book of Nehemiah is they ridiculed them. They actually made fun of them. Do you like being ridiculed? No, you do not. Nobody likes to be the the brunt of somebody else's sarcasm or the joke or the butt of a joke. 
So they criticized, they ridiculed. The third thing the enemy tribes did is, is they threatened them. And, and they actually said, we're gonna kill you. They threatened them with their lives. In verse 11, Nehemiah chapter four, it says this. Meanwhile, in spite of all these other three facts, it's taken too long, it's too, too, too complicated, and uh, we don't know what we're doing, and we don't doubt it, we doubt our ability. It says, meanwhile, our enemies are threatening to kill us in order to stop this work. Now, this is a legitimate reason to be discouraged. And we might die if we finish this project. Now, it's not just frustration and fear uh, and fatigue. It, uh, it, it is li literally a legitimate reason that we might die. But I want you to notice in this next verse, verse 12, who got discouraged first? It was those who were listening to the enemy, those who were listening to the wrong people. They weren't listening to God. They were listening to the non-believers. They were listening to the world, not to the word. Nehemiah 4 verse 12 tells us why they got discouraged. Then those of us who lived closest to our enemies, underline that, those of us who lived closest to our enemies kept reporting over and over 10 times, this is the power of repetition, that our enemies kept saying over and over, it doesn't matter where you go, we will attack you. Now I want you to listen very closely. If you're discouraged, if you keep hanging out with negative people and you keep constantly listening to negative talk radio and watching negative talk news and listening to negative talk chatter on social media, guess what? It's gonna infect you with fear. Some of you need to go on a diet of negativity. Stop filling your mind with negative words from television, radio, news, internet, social media. So those who live closest to the enemy, if you're listening to everything that's bad, and, and, and all the news today is bad news about our economy, about our world, about everything, about the government, everything, you're gonna get discouraged. And you're gonna become fearful. And fear is gonna grow. Let me ask you a personal question. What secret fear is causing you to be discouraged? Fear of criticism? Uh, you know, a fear of, uh, of embarrassment, so you hesitate to take a big step of faith. A fear that you're not capable of the task before you. A fear that, that you have to be perfect, that you have to be flawless. A fear that nobody will love you if they knew the real you. A fear that you can't handle the pressure. You've got some hidden fears, I'm sure of that, because we all do comes as a result of sin in a broken world. Now, how do you know when it's fear that is discouraging you? Oh, it's real simple. You have an intense desire to run, to escape. Let me out of here. And they say, let's just get out of here. Let's run away from the situation. So we've got fear, we've got frustration, and we've got fatigue, and we've got a sense of failure, and we've got fear. Those four things line up to cause discouragement in your life. What is God's cure when you feel like giving up? When you're at the halfway point in, in a project, in your life, in your ministry, in your marriage, or whatever, wh where do you find the strength and the motivation to finish whatever you started or what God has started in you? The Bible says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to the day of completion in Jesus Christ. How do I keep on going when I feel like giving up? Well, I'm glad you're thinking that question because you do the three things that Nehemiah did when he led the people to finish the wall. And here are the three things that he did. And you need to do these same three things to turn the setbacks from fear, frustration, fatigue, or failure into a comeback. Number one, first thing Nehemiah did, first thing you need to do, reorganize whatever's not working. 
Maybe something in your life, maybe something in your family, maybe something in your business, in your job. You may be doing the right thing, but in the wrong way. A lot of times when we get discouraged at what we're doing, we think, well, I must be doing the wrong thing. No, you may be doing the right thing. You're just doing it in the wrong way. And God says, I want you to do it differently. Keep doing what you're doing. Just do it differently. Nehemiah 4.13 says this. So I stationed armed guards. This is Nehemiah narrating in. I stationed armed guards at the most vulnerable places of the wall. And I assigned people by families with their swords and lances and their bows. Now, let me explain what's going on here. Nehemiah says, okay guys, we, we got enemies who wanna attack us. So here's what we're gonna do. Half of you are gonna do the work, working on the wall, and the other half of you are gonna stand guard, and then we're gonna switch. And the other half will do work on the wall, and the other half will guard. What's he doing? He's just coming up with a new plan. They did not give up on the goal. They just devised a new strategy. Now here's the point. Whatever you're discouraged at right now doesn't necessarily mean you need to stop doing it, doesn't mean you're doing the wrong thing. It may be, mean you're doing it in the wrong way. Nehemiah said, we gotta change the way we're doing this. And maybe you need to change the way you're doing your schedule, change the way you're doing your diet, change the way you're doing, the way you're relating to people. See, the natural temptation is to give up on the dream. No, 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 no. So let's just get personal. You got a problem right now? Well, don't give up. Just change where you're doing. You deeply in debt? Well, then you're gonna need to reorganize your budget. Are you out of shape? You're gonna need to reorganize your lifestyle, your eating patterns. Are you overcommitted in your schedule? You're gonna to need to reorganize your time. Where do you need to do what Nehemiah did? Reorganize whatever's not working. You may have a homework project this week. Now, that may mean that you need to eliminate some things out of your schedule or out of your life where you clean out the rubble. That's the clutter. That's the time wasters. That's the trivial things. You know, it, it's foolish to start a business with, without a business plan. Nobody in their right mind would ever do that, start a business without a business plan. But most Americans plan everything except their lives. Do you have a life plan? I want you to notice in the, the, this plan that Nehemiah comes with, he says he posted them by families. What does that mean? He, he made sure that they had support. What's your support group? One of the reasons you may be discouraged because you're trying to handle everything by yourself. You need a support group. You need to be in a small group. You need to start a small group. Hebrews 4.25 says this, some people have got out of the habit of meeting with other believers, but we must not do that. Instead, we should keep on encouraging each other. Who's encouraging you? Who are you encouraging? You need to be in a small group. Maybe your action step this week is say, oh, you know, the reason I'm discouraged is I'm not in a small group. I don't have a support group. He posted them by groups, by families. You need a spiritual family. If you don't have a spiritual family, you need to join Saddleback Church. Take class 101, or joining the family, discovering the benefits of being a part of a spiritual family. We teach that class every month at every campus. So that's where you need to reorganize whatever's not working in your life. Don't give up on the dream. Just look at it from a different direction. You can get some help on that. We can help you on that. You can get some counsel. And you need to get some support. Second thing Nehemiah did, reorganize whatever's not working. Number two, refocus on God. That's the next verse. In Nehemiah 4.14, it says this. Then, Nehemiah says, I looked over the situation and I called together all the leaders and the people and I said to them, don't be afraid of the enemy, remember the Lord. Underline that, remember the Lord who is great and glorious. He says, you know what? You've been so busy working for God, you've forgotten God. Has that happened in your life? Have you forgotten the Lord that you're working for? You're trying to serve? You can just be so busy doing the work for the Lord, you forget God's work in you. 
What you need to do is you need to refocus on God. You need to recommit yourself to Christ. You need to draw on spiritual resources. The Bible says when David got discouraged, it says, quote, he encouraged himself in the Lord. It doesn't say encouraged himself by watching TV or he encouraged himself by playing golf. It says he encouraged himself in the Lord. He says, remember the Lord, underline that. What do I remember when I'm discouraged? I remember three things. God's goodness to me in the past, God's closeness to me in the present, and God's power for me in the future. I get my mind off the discouraging circumstances, and I remember God's goodness and God's closeness and God's power, and remember that your thoughts determine your feelings, Discouragement is a feeling. If you want to change your feelings, you change what you think about. One of my favorite verses is in Jonah 2.7. Jonah swallowed up by the great fish and in the bottom of the ocean, he says this, when I'd lost all hope, I once again turned my thoughts to the Lord. That's what you need to do. If you've lost all hope today, you, you need to turn your thoughts to the Lord. David's antidote was the same thing, Psalm 119, 125, when he said, I'm completely discouraged, so revive me by your word. You need to get in the word of God. You need to be having a quiet time. If you're discouraged today, it means this, you're not spending enough time in the word of God. You're spending more time on social media than you are listening to God. That's a clear sign you're not spending enough time in the word because the word revives, refreshes, restores, rebuilds. So I reorganize what needs to be changed. Keep doing what you're doing, but do it in a new way. And then I remember and I refocus on the Lord. And then the third thing that Nehemiah does is he tells them to do this, and you need to do it too. Resist, resist the discouragement. This is your choice. You're gonna have to fight it. Resist the discouragement. You don't give in to it. Nehemiah 4.14, the second part says this. Nehemiah says, then I told them, fight, fight for your brothers. These are people who wanted to give up. Fight for your brothers, fight for your sons, fight for your daughters, fight for your wives, fight for your homes. Don't you dare give in without a fight. Friends, we're in a spiritual battle. We're in a warfare every day of your life. We're not in a playground, we're in a battleground. And as believers, we are called to engage in a spiritual battle every day of our life. Ultimately, it's already been won but there are battles going on every day. And we are in a supernatural struggle and mortal combat. And Satan is called the accuser of the believers and he's accusing you every day. And he would love to neutralize your effectiveness by discouraging you. His favorite weapons, Satan's two favorite weapons. I've been a pastor for 40 years. I've been walking with the Lord for about 55 years. And I know that the two favorite discouragement tools our fa two favorite uh, weapons of Satan are distraction and discouragement. Distraction to get you off your focus and discouragement. James 4, 7 says this, resist the devil. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. We are at war with negative thoughts, negative forces, negative emotions that want to keep us from developing our potential from God. For, for God. So make this, I, I, let me just be as clear as I can possibly say this. If you're discouraged right now, you need to hear this. Discouragement is a choice. It's a choice. You don't have to be discouraged. Nobody's holding a gun to your head right now. The reason you are discouraged is you are choosing to listen to discouraging thoughts, and that's your choice. You don't have to listen to those discouraging choice, those, those thoughts, it's your choice. You know the difference between great people and ordinary people? Great people simply refuse to be discouraged. Great people are just ordinary people with an extraordinary amount of determination. You know, I, I, I'm not, that smart, I'm not that talented, but there is one thing I've learned. I don't know how to quit. And I never, 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 never give up. Even when things are go wrong. And if God wants 
to use you the way he wants to use you and you're gonna be used the way he wants to use you, then you cannot give up even when you're fatigued, even when you're frustrated, even when you're fearful, even when you feel like you're failing, you just choose to keep going. When you're going through hell, you keep going. And maybe what God wants to say to you is this, keep going. Reorganize what's not working. Refocus on God and resist the discouragement. It's your choice. You're discouraged because you're choosing to think discouraging thoughts. You don't have to think those thoughts. Let me ask you a very personal question. What's unfinished in your life? Is, is there a relationship you need to reconcile or you, is there is a relationship uh, that somebody who's dead or something that you need to do closure on? Some of you have unfinished business with God. And, and yet, yet the wall's half finished. The, the project's half done. What have you known that God wants you to do, but you just keep putting it off? Maybe you've been checking, checking out Jesus Christ, maybe considering giving your life to him, but you've never stepped across the line. This weekend, we, we, we move into September. It makes me think of that verse in Jeremiah 8, 20 that says, the summer is over and we are not saved. Maybe that represents you. You have not been saved and the summer is over. Maybe you need to be baptized. Maybe you need to finish Saddleback's series of life development classes. You know, understanding your, uh, your Saddleback family, 101, 201, 301, 401. Maybe you got stuck at first base. You need to take your next step. Maybe you need to join a small group. You need that support. You're out there trying to build a wall on your own. It's not gonna work. You can't finish your life or your project by yourself. What has caused you to be discouraged today? If it's fatigue, you need to get some rest. If it's frustration, you need to reorganize what you're doing. Maybe you keep doing what you're doing, but you do it in a new way. And you need to get the rubble cleaned out. And you need to maybe change some relationships or change your schedule or change your eating plan or whatever needs to be cleaned out and, 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 and simplified in your life. Get your goals back in focus. If you've been feeling like a failure, remember that God loves you unconditionally, that he forgives you even if you've made mistakes and blown it and you've sinned. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. God loves to give second chances and Saddleback is the church of second chances. The S stands for second chance, place of grace. And if you've been discouraged because of worry or anxiety or fear, you need to resist. You need to resist the discouragement. You need to resist the devil. You need to fight for your future, fight for your family, fight for your goals, fight for your dream. Don't give up, discouragement is a choice. You don't have to live in discouragement. You don't have to listen to those negative thoughts. I know as your pastor, some of you are just barely holding on. And you may be thinking, Rick, it just isn't worth it. Friend, look up. Don't give up, look up. The answer may just be right around the corner. Hold on. You know, in 1981, I went through an entire year of depression and my emotions and my health were broken. And every Saturday, as I would prepare for Sunday, I would drive down to Laguna Beach and sit and watch the tide go out and watch it come in. And when the tide goes out, the, the beach is pretty ugly. It reveals a lot of, you know, junk and driftwood and stuff on the beach. But I've learned that when the tide goes out, it always comes back in. The tide may be out in your life right now, but it always comes back in. In my office, there's a plaque hanging on the wall in Hebrew and it says this, this too shall pass. I don't know what's going on in your life right now, but I will tell you that problem that you're in right now, it didn't come to stay, it, it came to pass. And tough times never last, but tough people do. So where do you get the, the power to keep going when you feel like giving up, particularly when you're at the halfway point, Jesus Christ can give you that inner strength. I wanna pray for you right now. Let's bow our heads. Father, I know that there are a lot of people who are discouraged here today because of fear, 
or frustration or fatigue or sense of failure. And some are tired and worn out and some are feeling like it's taken longer than I thought it would take. And some are thinking it's more complicated than I thought it would be. And some are saying, but people are attacking me and I'm under, I'm being criticized for what I'm trying to do. And, and some are scared and think I, I, I might lose my job and I'm, I'm, I might even lose my life. And there's all kinds of fears that come in our lives. Help us to do what Nehemiah did. Now you pray. And you, you pray these three steps. Say, Lord, today, I, 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 want, to, I want to refocus on you. I, I want to refocus on you. I want to remember the Lord, your goodness to me in the past. I want to remember that you're with me right now. I want to remember, remember that you're, you're going to give me the power in the future. And Lord, I, I need the strength to reorganize and, and, and not give up on what I'm doing, but do it in a new way so I'm not so frustrated and I'm not so fatigued that, that I'm, I don't feel like a failure, that I, I'm not afraid. Help me to clean out the rubble in my life and help me to see what that is. Maybe there's a relationship that's holding me back or I got too many things I'm doing that I need to simplify my life and simplify my, my budget and simplify my lifestyle and so many other things. Help me to remember the Lord and reorganize my life. And Lord, I'm asking you to give me the power to resist the discouragement and to fight for my future and to fight for my family and to fight for my career and fight for my dreams and to not just give in. Help me to remember that when I'm discouraged, that's a choice, that I don't have to remember those thoughts, but I can trust in you. If you've never opened your life to Christ, say, Jesus Christ, please come into my life right now. I can't do this on my own. I need a savior. I need you to be the manager of my life from this day forward. I want to follow you from this day on. I want to do whatever you tell me to do and trust you. I want to learn to love you. And I want to commit and surrender myself to you as best I know how. My way has not worked. I want to go your purpose for my life. And I humbly ask you to accept me into your family. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for checking out this message on YouTube. My name is Jay and I'm Saddleback's online pastor. I wanna invite you to take your next step by checking out our online community or help get you connected to a local Saddleback campus. Three things we have to offer you right now. First, learn more about belonging to a church family by taking class 101. Second, don't live life alone and get into community with others by joining an online small group or a local home group in your area. Third, Join our Facebook group to be more engaged with our online community throughout the week. Take your next step and learn where a local campus is near you by visiting saddleback.com online or email online at saddleback.com. Hope to hear from you soon.